Yeah, thanks very much. So yeah, probably too many screens uh, at the moment. Um, so yes, my name's Oliver. Um, today I'm going to be talking uh, about Drush Make and Composer. Um, I did have an alternative slide for this, um, which is Drush Make is Dead, Long Live Composer. Um, when I first started submitting this talk for Drupal conferences a couple of years ago, um, this statement wasn't technically accurate, um, though now it is. Um, so yeah, we'll be talking a lot about Drupal today. Has anybody, started being, has anybody here used Drupal at the moment for things? Okay, quite a few people, cool. Um, a few people who's been using Drupal 8? Okay, cool. Um, also, we're talking about Composer. So I guess most of us here are used to using Composer, right? So yeah, when I've given this talk at, say, Drupal camps and groups before, Composer for us then was quite a new thing. So it was very sort of entry level, what Composer is and what it does. I'm assuming here I can sort of skip over some of that, probably. Um, because Drupal 8 loves Composer. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a full stack web dev um, and sysadmin. Um, I work primarily with Drupal, I've been in Drupal since about 2008. Um, more recently, I've started doing um, some Symfony and some Laravel work as well. Um, and I guess just quickly to carry on from Gary's point with his closing keynote yesterday uh, about trying new tools and different programming languages, I'd also suggest if you're using one framework or one CMS to try some others as well. Um, I've taken quite a lot of inspiration from the work that I found in Symfony and Laravel and brought that back into my Drupal work. Uh, I've used quite a few Symfony components um, that are not native for Drupal at that time. Uh, and a big proponent of using um, Laravel collections um, in my code as well. Um, so I'm one of the lead developers at a company called Microserve. Um, we're a Drupal specialist agency based in Bristol. Uh, and we're one of the largest specialist Drupal companies uh, in the UK. Um, Acquia certified Drupal 8 Grandmaster, which sounds pretty cool. Um, I've contributed to Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 core. Uh, and I maintain um, a number of Drupal modules and, and PHP libraries as well. Uh, and I also co organize the PHP Southwest user group in Bristol, uh, also the Drupal Bristol user group. Um, as well as the Drupal camp that we do in, in Bristol every year as well. Um, so there's two goals, I guess, coming out of this talk. Um, the first one comes from when I was doing this at, at Drupal events. Um, if you're a Drupal person not using Composer, um, hopefully I can convince you within this talk that you should be doing it. Um, but also, if you're sort of a PHP person, just to uh, generalize a little bit too much, um, and you've maybe looked at Drupal uh, maybe a couple of years ago, um, maybe you're not considering it for, for projects right now. I'm hopefully, you're going to sort of change your mind on that as well. Um, and either sort of consider Drupal for your projects or sort of reconsider if you've uh, decided not to use it at some point. Um, so, just in case people aren't familiar, I'm going to just cover a little bit of what Drupal is. Uh, so, it's a PHP content management framework. Um, so, I don't necessarily tend to use the term CMS or content management system. Um, I tend to refer to it as a content management framework because it's a tool for essentially building your own CMS. So everything is sort of in your control. You can build your own content types, your own entities, your own fields, your own data structure, your own list pages. Um, you're not locked into a sort of a standard set of, uh, of, of those things. It's completely flexible. It's completely up to you as the, uh, the site builder to build what you want to use. Um, it's open source, so all of the Drupal code is hosted on Drupal.org, uh, as well as all of the uh, contributed modules and themes and distributions. Um, the caveat, most of them are hosted on there. Um, that's sort of the official place. Um, some of them are hosted on GitHub, primarily, or, or other places. Uh, and again, in most cases, those are sort of mirrored back to Drupal.org, and people are sort of pushing commits back and forth. Um, but D.O. is where like all the issue queues are and like that type of thing, and where all of our contribution system is all hosted. Um, it's modular, so you download Core. Core gives you X amount of functionality out of the box. But if you want commerce, for example, I mentioned commerce quite a few times during this talk, you could download extra modules, uh, install them, and that gives you more stuff. So essentially, Symfony bundles. So it's the same sort of analogy. Uh, distributions, so you can download Drupal Core, 
when you install Drupal the first time, um, some of you will probably remember this, that you can see two options, and you see minimal, and you see standard, and you pick what you, which version you want to install. These are distributions. So you can install the minimal distribution and get the minimal amount of stuff, uh, and you build it all up from scratch, or you choose the standard distribution, and it gives you more out of the box, gives you your articles, content type, your pages, and some sort of same defaults that maybe nine times out of 10 projects you're going to want to use. Um, there are other distributions, so if you're building a social network, if you're building a magazine um, website, if you're building um, anything like that, yeah, various things, the pre-packaged um, ver versions you can use that already have modules that you'll need installed and pre-configured already for you. Again, we'll talk about those a little bit more as well. Um, prior to Drupal 8, um, the code was mostly procedural. So I I think from Drupal 6, when I started being involved, everything was procedural, so very wordpress -y, I guess, if I can say that. Um, Drupal 7 started using object-oriented code in places, so the database abstraction layer was uh, object-orientated, the migration uh, modules were object-oriented, um, whereas in Drupal 8, we've gone very much OO in, all in on, on object-oriented code. Um, so we got off the island, I guess, is the phrase that we used to tend to use um, for Drupal 8. Uh, and we've adopted the principle of probably found elsewhere rather than not invented here. So we've been bringing in third-party code and using them as part of Drupal rather than writing everything ourselves. Um, and likewise, in the tooling that we use, so all of our issue queues are built using Drupal. Um, Drush Make, which we're going to talk a lot about in a minute, is obviously primarily based for Drupal. Uh, and those things are sort of now being phased out, and best practice industry standard tools are sort of coming in. Um, simple test is another example, um, which we get to. Um, so yes, Drupal 8 is awesome. So I do a slight more Drupal sales pitch. Um, because of the tools that we've been using, so object oriented code, Symphony code, Composer, Guzzle, PHP unit, we're using part of Zen, we're using part of Doctrine, we're using Stack. We're using modern libraries that rather than, again, write everything ourselves, which is pretty awesome. Uh, at the last count, they were, according to the Symphony project page, 16 Symphony components used in Drupal 8, which is, again, pretty awesome. Um, and again, if you know those components, you can then just pick them up and then reuse them um, in Drupal. Um, so reusable knowledge for me is a big, I think, almost side effect of, of a smooth to object oriented code. Um, there's an example recently, so story. Um, I sat with one of our developers the other week and we're implementing a feature in the, in the Drupal 8 site where a user logs in, uh, we check if, they, if they've accepted the terms and conditions of the website. If they have, we can just redirect them off to the home page or, or wherever we need to redirect them to. Um, if they hadn't, we have to take them to the terms and conditions page for them to accept before we can um, proceed. Um, so we had a checkbox, a Boolean field onto the user object. That was what we were checking when they logged in. Um, so what we ended up implementing was, um, so the first version was very sort of Drupal 7-ish. Uh, we then refactored it to use be more modern uh, using a service class, which we call the Terms Enforcer. That was responsible for all of our figuring out, do they have the box checked? Do like, all that logic is encapsulated there? And then we just referenced that from the three or four um, entry points that where we had to reference it from. So when they log in, when they register, um, I think there were two or three others as well. So using a very service class or our service class approach, um, this is reusable because then I was working on some Symphony code that night. Took my laptop into work the next day and said, "This is what I've been doing in Symphony. This is using exactly the same approach using service classes." So it's a slight difference as we're calling it from Drupal hooks rather than from within a controller, but the principle was exactly the same. And I think it's that reusable knowledge now. We're not sort of just learning Drupal 7 like we would have been before and learning about um, hooks and just Drupal specific things. We're learning about techniques that can be reused across other projects and other frameworks. Uh, and I think that's why we're seeing um, traditional sort of Drupal agencies now um, expanding and working with Symfony and Laravel and other, other frameworks as well, and also vice versa. So I think that's pretty awesome. Um, so Drush, if anyone's not familiar with Drush, um, Drush is 
essentially the uh, Drupal CLI. Um, so it's the command line interface for Drupal. Um, so if you're thinking um, sort of bin console for Symfony or Artisan for Laravel. Um, the slight difference being um, it's not included with Drupal core. Um, so it's hosted on GitHub rather than on Drupal.org. It's got its own release cycle. It's a sort of separate, separate project. Um, I think it was first released for Drupal 5 back in 2007, so even since before I was involved with the project at all. Um, so there's a few different ways we can go about setting up Drupal projects, so I'm going to cover sort of all three of them. Um, the first is download all the things, and I think this is how, we, at least how I started out, and I think most others do as well. Uh, it's just to go to Drupal.org, um, find the Drupal project page or the module page, the, the page for the module that you want to install. You get options for zip files or, or targe zip files, and you download them. You copy and put them into the right place in your repository, and that's how you install the modules. Um, Drush does offer a, a DL command, so a download command, which sort of does the same thing for you. So you do Drush DL um, path auto, and it sort of automates that step. Um, and then you just commit everything into your one big repository and, and push it, and well, that's fine. Um, that's great. It's probably the easiest way to set up, get set up initially, um, but I think in the long term, probably more difficult to maintain. Uh, if, if you want to then update a module, you have to delete the old files, and then you need to download the new files from scratch. You need to copy and paste and replace the existing files. So that can be quite time consuming and a little bit tedious. Um, another downside to this is then you've got Drupal core, you've got all your contrib codes, all your extra modules and themes um, if you, in, into your project repository as well, um, and, and vendor code as well if you're using Composer in that setup. So option two is Drush Make. Um, and Drush Make is a tool, or technically an extension for Drush, uh, which allows you to define your project as code. Um, so the first version used sort of an INI, any style syntax. Um, there's now a, a YAML version as well. Um, so you can use it to create your own projects, or you can use it to create reusable distributions. So those distributions I mentioned before, like um, Commerce Kickstart, for example, is using a Drush Make file to say which modules that, that distribution um, includes. Uh, so this is a, an example. So this is using the any syntax. Um, we call the, the, the file my project something dot make. Uh, we start by defining the API version and, and version of core. So this is from Drupal 7. Uh, and we can start listing our projects. So the first thing we want to list is, is Drupal itself. Uh, we can define it as being core. Uh, and then specify the version, so in this case we're using 7.51. Uh, we can expand on that and then pull in additional projects. So um, Path Auto module allows for automatically generating um, human-readable paths. So we can install that. We can install version 1.3. And if, for example, the best, best practice, at least the way I prefer to do things, is to put all my contrib modules in a directory called contrib, and then likewise my custom modules in a directory called custom. So we can do that by specifying subdo, uh, and also if we want to apply patches, we can we can apply patches uh, using the patch key. Um, then once you've got that, we can then run drush make file name output directory. So build Drupal Bristol dot make and then output that into a directory called build, uh, and it gives you this output. So it tells you that it's running, and then just lists the files that it, uh, that it downloads for you. Uh, this is great until you try to rebuild it. So you add another module, or you add a new theme, or you update something. You think, OK, I'll just run Drush Make again, and it tells you that the path already exists, and then exits with a, an error code. This is not great. So a few limitations of Drush Make. Uh, it's Drupal specific. So this was fine. I mean, this was, it was a great solution for, for a few years ago before Composer really sort of joined the party. Um, I prefer now to use use Composer, use the modern sort of tooling. Um, you need to use multiple repositories, or at least I have been when I've used this setup before. So my Drush Make file lives in one Git repository. My custom modules go into another repository. Uh, custom themes, likewise, and, and everything else. So, and then once it's actually built, that goes into another repository. So we've now got four, three or four things, depending on how complex your project is, um, which is sort of technical debt, I guess, in a way. but just hard to maintain going forward. 
can't update the existing build. You just saw that. That's, that's quite annoying. Um, and you need to run an extra sort of step as a compile it. So you maybe have to use um, Jenkins as some sort of CI tool. When you push an update to your make file, it pulls your other modules in and it downloads everything again, pushes it to another repository, and that's the one that gets deployed. Uh, and also, we need to define specific versions. So if you recall, we're saying install Drupal 7.54 uh, um, or Path Auto 1.3. Um, it's going to be very specific, and then that's the version it installs. If you want to install the next version, you have to increase the number by one and rerun through the whole process again, which is, is not great. Um, so Drush Make is not a dependency manager. It's just a, case, it's just a tool that tech passes your file and just automates the downloading of things. <coughs> so I'm not quite sure who actually said this quote. I seem to re I recall it from somewhere. I think it was Ryan from, from Commerce Guys, but I might be wrong. Um, but somebody said, if you're not using a dependency manager, you're the dependency manager. So it's up to me or whoever's building the site to figure out which versions work with which other versions and make sure everything sort of fits together. And I don't want that responsibility, really. OK, um, I've got a very short video for doing for Drush Make. Let's see if we can get this to work. And we've got the wrong screen. We are we VLC. There we go. I knew this was a bad idea. It's VLC. There we go. So we hit so okay. So we'll start just by um cutting out the make file. So in this case it's called my project.make got the same content in that we had before. We can then run drush make project, name of the directory. It's just going to start to begin the project, download the things that we want to tell it to download, and we can just open it in an editor and see what it's done. That's, that's pretty much what it does. So. Cool. Um, let me find my speaker notes again. Yeah, I've gone. It doesn't matter. OK, um, so the, the point that sort of makes this talk a little bit more relevant again um, is so the Drush Make extension uh, was removed uh, in Drush 9. So it's no longer there. And it's been deprecated in favor of Composer. Um, actually, when I looked through the commit logs for Drush, uh, and it basically says, don't replace Drush Make with Composer. Um, so option three is, is Composer. Again, Drupal 8 loves Composer. Um, so again, I, I'm still going to put a slide in and explain a little bit what Composer is in case anybody doesn't know, um, which is fine. Um, so it's a dependency manager for PHP. So we specify which versions we want to use, or minimum versions of. Composer then figures out which versions are compatible based on what we give it. So we don't need to figure that out. Composer can do that for us. Downloads packages into a vendor directory. Not 100% true. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but that's what it usually does. Uh, it downloads packages from one or more repositories. So this is pretty important for this setup. Um, obviously, the main repository, the default repository, is Packagist. Um, Drupal.org exposes its own endpoints. Um, there was a Drupal Packagist, which is a, a separate repository um, that was around for a while. Um, that was then sort of deprecated once the uh, actual Composer package was put in place on Drupal.org. So we could add more than one repository, which we'll see in a minute. And the cool thing is that we can actually ignore Drupal core entirely, because we can install it as a dependency. We can remove all of our contrib code, and so we don't need to put all of our contributor modules into our repository, and all of our vendor code also can be ignored. So we have less files in our repository, uh, which means we can clone it faster, which is, which is great. Um, if we're doing code reviews, then we get smaller code reviews, because we don't get a commit that says updated core, and then we get 1,000 files or, or so changed, however many GitLab can show us. Um, and that also means that um, the team will spend uh, less time code reviewing because there's less to code review. And we can sort of not have to work around the files we want to ignore because they're not there. Um, I mean, the team then can be more focused on just m reviewing what we need to review, so i.e. all the custom code that we've, that we've written. 
and we're able to provide minimum required versions. So rather than trash make, and we say we have to install 1.3, we can say with Compose that we want to install 1.3 plus. And then every time we just want to run a Composer install, it's going to, or an update, it's going to then figure out for us which of the versions that fit together. So there's less of a maintenance cost involved here because we don't have to manually update 1.3 to 1.4. So Composer figures that out for us, which is, which is nice. Um, so here's an example of using Composer to, to require um, Silex. Because again, once we did, when I did this at a Drupal camp, people hadn't seen this before. Again, I'm assuming this is sort of familiar to, to most people. Um, we can say Composer requires Silex, and because Silex uh, depends on Pimple, it installs that as well. So again, Drush Make, because it's not the dependency manager, you could say install Path Auto, and it would just download Path Auto. Path Auto has dependencies, um, but Drush Make doesn't know that. So you have to be specific and give it every module that you want to install. Composer doesn't. Um, that's in our Composer JSON file. This is what we get by running the command. I think we all know this already. Um, so Composer in Drupal specifically. Um, Drupal 8 uses Composer for all this dependency management. As I mentioned, we pull in code from Symfony, Zen, Stack, Doctrine, etc. Um, this is all done using um, Composer. Um, and also, also loading uh, is all done through Composer. Um, so Drupal, the first versions of Drupal 8, so Drupal 8, Point zero point something um, still had the vendor directory in core. Um, it's no longer there, which is which is awesome. We figured out that auto-loading problem. Um, so Drupal seven, which is, is still still around, still supports, is still stable, and will be for some time. Um, does not use Composer at all um, because there's no need for it at the moment, uh, I guess. So we're not pulling in aids so of dependencies from from third parties really, or if we are, um, we're using modules like Composer Manager or uh, X autoload, which gives you sort of PSR for level autoloading, uh, or modules like libraries, which uh, sort of tries to do what Composer does, but you reference libraries explicitly, and it's still sort of up to you to put them into the right place and, and, and sort of manage them. So, Okay, so now we sort of have a crash course or crash reminder on Composer. How do we use Composer to build Drupal? Um, so there's two ways we could do this. Um, there's a package called Drupal Drupal, which is available on Packagist, um, which is just cool. Um, there's also a Drupal Composer, um, Drupal Composer Drupal project, which is not maintained by the core maintainers. It's a separate project, by some of the core maintainers, but it's not an official sort of Drupal project. Um, and that includes core as a dependency. I'll talk about that in one moment. Um, so both of these we can install with Composer Create Project because they're b both on packages. So we can require Drupal Drupal. Um, we can say we're going to require at least 8.4. So we're on 8.4.4, I believe, right now. Um, or we can use Composer Create Project, and we can use Drupal Composer Drupal Project. Try saying that 10 times really fast. Um, again, give it a site name and set the stability level, etc. So um, just, let's just compare those two. Um, so Drupal Drupal is, as I say, minimal, like just core. So no extras or, or anything in there. Um, and you get core at the, uh, the, so the, the root level of, of, what it, of, of that project. Um, the Drupal Composer project is different, and it ins uses its own Composer JSON, and rather than I think it's right. So the original one is going to install core as the root of your, as the center of your project. The Drupal project, compo Drupal composer, Drupal project doesn't. It requires core as a dependency of that project, and then all of your extra modules are control dependencies of that. So rather than us altering core's composer JSON file, we're altering our project composer JSON file, which to me seems a lot more sensible. So this is sort of sort of similar to um, Symphony Skeleton, I guess, in, in some way. Um, the other big advantage is um, the Drupal Composer Drupal project um, is available for Drupal 8 and also for Drupal 7. Um, so again, Composer in natively in core is only for Drupal 8, not Drupal 7. But if you want to go down this route, we can do Drupal 7 with Composer and pull in all dependencies that way, which is great. Um, so managing those dependencies. 
Um, as I said, we can install drupal.org where all the modules are hosted and the themes are hosted, exposed as an endpoint. So there's a subdirectory called packages.drupal.org. Um, we can install that as a repository into our composer JSON file. The Drupal composer, Drupal project does this for us, um, but we can also do it manually if you want to go down the, um, the other path. And then we get this in our, in our composer JSON file again. Um, obviously, this is for Obviously, this is for Drupal 8, um, because it's slash 8. If you want to do this for Drupal 7, it would be slash 7. So configuring paths. Um, so traditionally, um, all of your libraries and you saw things via Composer go into a vendor directory. Awesome. Um, this uses a, a plugin called Composer Installers, and it means that we can put things where we want to put them and also where Drupal expects them to be. Um, so if you're installing uh, a, a contributed module, Drupal expect, or Drupal 8 at least, will expect that to be in the modules directory. Um, if you're doing it in a Drupal 7 project, it'll be site slash something slash modules. And again, sort of best practice will say, if it's a contrib module, so one that's available on drupal.org, it goes modules contrib, module name. If it's a custom module, modules custom, or modules sites slash modules custom. Um, likewise for themes, themes contrib, themes custom, uh, and again, profiles are going to install Commerce Kickstart as a, as a profile or any of any others. Um, we can install that into the profiles directory, and it does this using um, the type key. So within each module to compose a JSON file, uh, there's a type, and the type can be Drupal module or Drupal profile, Drupal theme. And because of that, it's put into the right directory, and Drupal can, can find it, which is awesome. Um, so once we've got that in place, we can just use Composer to require Drupal modules and themes. Um, so we've now got the Drupal slash namespace available. So again, it's not from packages, it's coming from Drupal.org. Because we've added the repository, we can then pull this in. So in this case, we can say we've gone to install um, the path auto module again. Um, we can install at least 1.0, because this is a slightly old slide. Um, and then, yeah, this is going to install the path auto module. But as I said, path auto has dependencies. So path auto relies on token, and path auto relies on C tools. And because we're using Composer now, Composer knows that and downloads those for us. Oh, that's how to, so we've moved, removed two lines from our file, essentially, but less, less mental overhead for us, because Composer knows these things. Awesome. Um, also, Drupal modules may have dependencies that are not other Drupal modules. So Commerce is yeah, a very good example of this. Commerce guys were one of the um, sort of four, I was say four thinkers, one of the big um, drivers, I guess, of Composer. Um, so when they started to rewrite Drupal Commerce for Drupal 8, they started literally from scratch. Um, so started from scratch, but then rather than keeping all of their sort of business logic for writing things like addresses and tax, um, keeping that all in the Drupal modules, so they decided to write PHP agnostic, framework agnostic PHP libraries um, that they could then reuse. So that the modules now are very small, and they're just referencing the libraries they've already written, um, which are available on, on Packagist um, using the Commerce Guide's namespace, uh, which is great for them, because then we can then reuse those libraries in Drupal and um, I think Foxycart and Magento and other sort of e commerce projects. Um, but yeah, this is great. So by requiring the Drupal address module, it knows that we need to pull in the Commerce Guide's addressing library, and it will just do that for us. Uh, adding themes, so we can have, if you want our site to look nice, we need to install a theme. Uh, we do that exactly the same way. Uh, so in this case, we're going to install a theme called Omega, and it's going to be least Omega 5. Uh, patching, so occasionally we have to, to patch things. Um, we can do this by installing um, the Composer Patches plugin. Excuse me. And then within our Composer JSON file, um, within the extra key, we can just define patches. Um, start by just telling it which project we're going to uh, patch, so Drupal, Drupal, in case of core. Uh, you give it a, a short description and then a link to the patch that we want to pull in. So um, this one's coming from, from an issue queue on Drupal.org, so it's node 1543, et cetera. Um, which is cool. Um, but we can also pull in um, local patches, which I found quite recently. So uh, if you're working on a project and you need to um, 
patch something that's only really specific for you. You can keep a patches directory in your repository and um, pull them in that way, which is great. Um, updating. So again, I think this is um, most people here should sort of know this, I guess. Um, so we can use Composer install um, to update local code. Oh, that's the wrong one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can compose install to update the versions, then composer.lock, and then we can use composer install to install them from the lock file. Yeah, those are backwards. That's not good. Um, it's great. So it just means to install our Drupal, to update our Drupal project, <laughs> we can just then use compose update command, uh, and then also, I think with dependencies is default, um, but I can just include it anyway. Uh, this will go through our whole project and just update everything. Uh, and then once we've done that, we can then just use Composer install to install everything. Okay, another another demo. Let's see if I can remember to do this this time. So Drupal Composer. Yeah, running. Not running. Okay. Well, you can see that. Okay, so in this case, we're going to install Drupal, a Drupal 8 site completely from scratch. So we're going to use the composer create project command, pull in the Drupal composer Drupal project project. Um, we're going to call it my Drupal site um, and set the stability as we were doing before. Um, cool. So in a second, we can see that it's installing um, everything. Um, it's created that my Drupal site directory. It's pulling in all of our packages, so all the Symfony projects, uh, Guzzle, um, what else can we see in there? Twig, DeFi Dev, um, PHP Documenter, PHP Unit for unit for all our unit testing now, um, Behat, Zen Framework, Doctrine, Cache, Drupal Core itself. Um, that one takes a few seconds. I didn't do that for dramatic pause. Um, I once it's done that, and um, there's another project in there called Drupal Scaffold, which will create. Uh, if you can see at the bottom here, um, create a sites default settings.php and also a sites default files directory. So these are pro files and directories we need to create in order for Drupal to sort of run, I guess. And then settings.php is where you put your database credentials and everything, if, if people don't know. Um, so Drupal Scaffold does that for us. And it's, that runs by using um, a composer script on post install, which is great. Cool. So once that's run, um, I can see the inside directory, and I think we're going to open. Yeah, we're going to open this up first in Sublime to see what's going on. Uh, we can see that it's created this whole directory structure for us. Um, so it's kept. So it installs Drush as part of its dependencies as well, which is awesome. Uh, we have some Composer scripts. We have a vendor directory where it's installed all the vendor packages. This is also great because it's outside of the doc root, which is great for security as well. Um, Drupal lives within the web directory. And we can see that at this point we have no contrib modules at all because we haven't installed any. So what we'll do next, we'll try to open this up in a browser. And any second now, we should have a Drupal 8 site pop up. Any second now. There we go. So this is the Drupal 8 install page. This is Drupal 8.4.4. Uh, we can choose our language because Drupal 8 is really awesome for multilingual as well. Um, these are the standard installation profiles. So we're going to use standard in this case. We're going to put in our database credentials, uh, I've got re secure credentials for this one. It's all done within Docker containers, so I can just set them to, to Drupal Drupal. Uh, but also, I'm running it with a DB container, so I need to set that as the host. And then, in a second, is, yep, Drupal's going to install. Fast forward a little bit there, it takes a few minutes to run normally. Um, 40 modules installed in, in, within the, the standard profile, so it takes a few minutes. And then once this is running, we can start configuring the site, give it uh, our site name of admin. I wouldn't suggest using admin on production, but locally it's fine. Um, put in my pass passwords and configure our time zones, and then just go ahead and continue. Again, any second now, right. Today we have Drupal 8 installed. Awesome. So again, we haven't, all we've had to run to do this is just run one command, which is which Compose require. Drupal, pro Drupal, Drupal, Drupal project. Awesome. Um, we can click on the extend button uh, in the navbar. These are our modules that we've got installed. Um, currently, we've only got core modules, 
if we search for path also, we don't have one and we haven't told it to install it. But what we can do is run compose require Drupal slash path auto. Well, you've already seen. This will go to Drupal.org, trying to download path auto, also install the dependencies for path auto. So we should see C tools and we should see token. Again, any second now. We'll grab some water. Okay, so we can see token, we can see C tools, and we can see path auto. Awesome. So yeah, if we go back to Sublime, we go into our web directory, go into modules, we now have a new contrib directory, and we get our three modules. We go back to our Drupal site, we can refresh the page and search again, search for path auto. We don't have path auto, we can go ahead, we can enable it, we can install it. Awesome. We have a Drupal 8 site. So, real examples. So, um, the Drupal Bristol website of the Drupal Bristol user group um, is all hosted on GitHub. Um, this is, um, we use the Drupal Composer Drupal project to maintain our website. So, we can go there and check that out. Um, so, yeah, I guess in summary, Drupal is awesome, Composer is also awesome. Use them both together. Um, more modules and more distributions are moving to Composer. So, um, as I said, Commerce is, is a very big uh, proponent of Composer because of their own, they're pulling out actually their own libraries. Um, other modules, so uh, MailChimp comes to mind, um, pulls in the uh, MailChimp API for PHP from ThinkShow, and uh, Switch API uh, Solar will pull in uh, the Solarium, I'm saying that right, um, library. Um, there are others. Um, this definite trend of Drupal modules doing less and Drupal PHP libraries doing more and those being pulled into Drupal. Um, distributions, um, so I say Drupal uh, Josh Make is the default way or has been for defining our distributions to install. This also is changing because Josh has gone away, Josh Make has gone away in, in Josh 9. Um, and we're seeing distributions like Acquia Lightning uh, a, hosted on GitHub, because um, Drupal.org doesn't yet support composer-based distributions. Um, but Acquia Lightning uh, is sort of one of the new hotnesses at the moment, um, is hosted on GitHub and, and uses Packagist, and is available on Packagist within the Acquia daemon space. So there's a definite trend of, of that being happening more and more. Um, and I guess, so in my opinion, um, using Composer enforces best practice, so we have don't have to go and just, I've taken over projects before and then update module X and module X, module X has been hacked because they want to change the ordering of something and then updating the module breaks everything. Um, so we can't do that anymore. We don't have that in, not that I would do it. Um, people can't, generally can't do that <laughs> anymore because that module doesn't exist in the repository. So we have to then start writing, let's say, start writing patches for those modules. Um, and I guess a byproduct of that will increase contribution. So Again, big open source um, thing around, around Drupal and contributing to core and, and to modules. If you've written a patch to fix a problem already, then why not just submit that patch to, to Drupal.org and back to the whole project? So, um, and there's, there's a quite the interesting thing recently about Drupal.org issue queues is that if you're working on um, issues on behalf of a company, you can tag both yourself and the company that you work for and also clients that you work for if they're, if they're on those organizations, and then everybody gets credit for doing that. And then one of the byproducts of that is there's a marketplace listing, and the marketplace listing is ordered by how much contribution people have done. Um, so the company, I say the company, um, the com companies will get better exposure in places like that marketplace because they're contributing more, um, as well as yeah, dev happiness, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, use Composer. Um, some resources, so obviously Get Composer is where we get Composer. Um, Symphony.com projects Drupal is, is Drupal's project based on Symphony, where it outlines the, the components that we're currently using. Um, 
this documentation page is on Drupal.org that explains how to do more or less what I've just already shown. Uh, and then this is the uh, GitHub link to uh, the Drupal Compose project.